Hi, live streaming. Let's see, I think. Let me see. I've got to find. There it is. I was looking for my little clock that shows that, like, the tape, if you will, or the video is rolling. So, oh, I have a lot on my mind. And I've had a lot on my mind my entire life. If you know me, you probably get a headache from me. I talk too much, many people think. I think out loud. That's annoying. Oh, thank God, I guess I'm living alone because, oh, I don't know. Anyway, so um, we're not even going there. But um, I have um, some thoughts and um, I'm going to share them as I am working on a little linen closet project. So right now you're just going to have to bear with me while and I am live but since I don't have any subscribers I don't think any of you can join me or like uh, unless you're, uh, yes that was the toilet um but uh because I don't have any subscribers or a limited number of subscribers on my channel uh huh um uh, yeah, it's not like Clubhouse, really. So it's not like I have a room full of people and we're having a topic and, you know, we're going to have a forum and a conversation, uh, which many people didn't know anything about Clubhouse <clears throat> and that kind of forum environment, a think tank, if you will, um, you know, during the pandemic. And so that kind of think tank was beautiful for me. And uh, when I say that, it allowed for me not to be alone in a time where I had no choice but to be alone. And so not only do I hate loneliness, but I feared being alone. And so we're not going there, but you know, yeah. So anyway, today I'm going to talk about it. Quantitative easing versus qualitative easing. And some of you economic folks, MBAs, or even just business folks, um, will be like, what? And some of you will be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So uh, quantitative, quantitative easing, you know, is flooding the economy with money. So it's what the Fed does, right? It's what the uh, government decides to do in America. And from a historic standpoint, we've been doing this for quite some time. And many people think it's going to be the demise, the end of capitalism. I don't. And so here's an original thought for me. And maybe I wish somebody who was maybe somebody is going to have to help me work through this conundrum, okay? Because I can't remember if quantitative easing is a phenomena or if I'm just making that up. <laughs> so if I'm not making it up, forgive me. But right now it feels like that's just, a, I don't know, spin. Um, <clears throat> but so when I say qualitative easing, um, I am not thinking of something that's textbook that I learned from my MBA or from my business or my you know, studies. But what I'm thinking about is the monetary system and the climate in America today. And so, um, you know, there's some amazing, and I can't quote them either, but there are some amazing YouTubers out there with absolute excellent explanation as to how money works in America dare I say, how money works in the West, um, in the free world. That's what I'm going to say. <clears throat> and so my observation is that we have cryptocurrency. Yes, we do. And we have digital currency. Yes, we do. And Bitcoin, which is digital currency. I don't know if Bitcoin is crypto, but it's digital. And Bitcoin is a little like gold in that there's a 
finite number. And so from a theoretical standpoint, if Bitcoin becomes the basis, the gold standard, so to speak, <clears throat> you know, crypto might take off. And it all does really depend on what the kids want to do, what the youth want to do, what the middle class and, you know, decide to embrace. And so it, it, it's all about trends. Uh, if you've ever had a taste of Malcolm Gladwell, maybe that's who I should be calling uh, and or inquiring to, but because he is, um, well, I think he's more liberal than I am, but I could be mistaken, but I think he's very, very observant. And so my question actually becomes, what if up until 2022, you know, two years post-pandemic, global problem. Every century has a major, mega global problem, okay? What if the monetary system had, you know, like I used to work um, in the financial services space. And so when, when I, whenever I think of bubbles, I think of bubble gum and I think of, just so you know, like bubbles, like... <laughs> like suds, like blow me a bubble, okay? And so, but what if um, we're not talking about bubbles, we're talking about balloons, because bubbles are much more fragile than balloons. But let's just say that the monetary and the economics, and we, you know, up until that point, which let's just be fair, Bitcoin came around in 2008, crypto's newer, I don't know, I have the back states to expound upon on that but um but if that balloon so to speak along with the american dollar or the western monetary system <clears throat> the fed i'm saying western and you know like I'm, i just need to stay in america you know uh, forgive me all of you europeans especially the germans but you know like who are going to get a little bit bent out of shape with my pontification here but what if that balloon has in fact like some of the air has been let out of the balloon because from an economic standpoint of digital currency and cryptocurrency. I think it's a good question. And if some of the air has been, so if a balloon gets so, so big, just like a bubble, of course, it will pop right but if if we're talking about balloons rather than bubbles from a monetary standpoint and digital slash and it's probably totally inappropriate to have two balloons and lump crypto and digital together because really to be honest with you hell you know digital currency has been operating since credit cards well actually well for a very long time I mean it's all about leverage but, um, but yes, and so what if the climate is that we are dealing with balloons and maybe digital currency is its own balloon, but, you know, there's that Pareto chart. I feel like there's overlap, right? But again, because of cryptocurrency, because of the blockchain, because of Bitcoin, because of just this absolute hunger for um, technological advancement. What if we don't go into a recession? <sighs> All of the major guys, and you know, forgive me ladies, but you know, the, ec the economic indicators and so the experts are saying, America should have a recession. What if we don't? And what if it's because of cryptocurrency? Not the NFT side, but the NFT side gets 
very interesting. Very, very interesting. But um, yeah, can somebody actually, I feel like I should just abruptly end and see if anybody will comment. I don't know, some of you guys and or gals. What's her name, Corey? What's her name? Like, can't you start a podcast, lady? I mean, you speak about business all the time. Why don't you get behind the mic and start asking people questions like this? Is it Corey? What is your name? You know, the long haired lady that's an influencer that always pops up on my YouTube channel. Hmm. Her strategy is by, it's very aligned with the uh, Warren Buffett. It's, uh, you know, buy and, you know, buy businesses that are already operating, buy simple business, stay the hell away from certain ones and actually, you know, uh, gravitate towards, you know, some of the businesses that are very unlikely to fail, such as vending machines, laundromats. Car washes. And she says buy uh, businesses that are um, operating. She, she honestly is speaking. If she, her, she, she's talking like Warren Buffett, folks. So anyway, you know who you are. And I could find out if I looked at my YouTube. But um, so you should be following me probably only because I pay att attention enough of you that um, we could have a conversation, I guess. <sighs> right, isn't that what this is all about? About relationships, it's about conversations, it's about growth, learning, advancement. And at the end of the day, it's about love. It's about relationships. It's really about, yes, being engaged is something phenomenal that is way bigger than uh, us little tiny people. So, you know, if I need to continue to stay away from the soft language that many people that are not Christians would just like vomit at is, um, you know, it's about synergy, right? But, you know, it's about popcorn. It's about making money. It's about surprise, right? So, yeah, that's, that's that. All right, so this is what I'm really doing today. Painting. And so I'm painting the inside of this closet. Yellow. So um, what I have observed from some of the and learned from some of the YouTube consumption that I have ingested recently is that when it comes to interior design and or freshening up your house, um, be careful in bathrooms in particular with the color green, but also in bedrooms. So I don't have any green, uh, you cannot see this, but I, I'm actually like at my feet, I have, it's an absolute mess. And even though the cord is hanging down like this, I'm not even plugged in and you, I think, I think it's very evident though. My laptop sitting on the toilet. How gross. Poop humor, right? The household throne. Ah, oh, the satire, the sarcasm, the, oh my gosh, I need some sleep. But sometimes, just like Steve Jobs and Einstein and Yes, I mean, sometimes when we don't have sleep, we have, we do our best thinking. 
But I think it actually takes us to an edge. And when I say that, I do not want to go over the edge. I do not want to go over the guard rail, so to speak. So oh, I'll be right back. Um, I need to, what, how many minutes are we in to this live 15? Okay, yeah, I'll be right back because I'm gonna grab. So a little while ago, if you, meaning today on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, this was brown. And now, even though it's not white, it's light. So don't split hairs with me. But I'm just here to tell you that if we were talking shades, not of gray, but shades of white, that it would look like yellow compared to the exterior frame of my door. And that's the way things go sometimes. So I'm gonna have what is appearing to be white exterior closet and cream interior. But it's gonna look good because this, and it's not plywood, but this wood is, it's not, uh, finished. and so this will just actually, if you will, refresh things a bit. And if there's something that Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer taught us is that sometimes it's all about the refresh, right? Whitewash. Just so you know, I'm searching desperately. Ah, and I can't find it, but I'm search I was searching in my head and desperately uh, for a screwdriver. I need a screwdriver for two reasons. One, I'm taking, I need it, well, I don't need it anymore because I innovatively use this, but um, yeah, so from an innovative standpoint, I, oh, here we go. I used something other than the screwdriver, but I do want a screwdriver because the screwdriver, will allow me to take off this doorknob and paint it. But you know what? I may not, I'm, I'm actually not gonna sweat the small stuff. You should actually keep track of the number of book titles that I use in my vernacular. That would be a fun thing for me to challenge my students I'm a substitute teacher and I don't do it because I'm bored. But um, yeah, you know, fur, right? Innovation, fur, right? Oh, you clever child. Oh, you clever girl. Oh, clever, clever. Oh my gosh. Why God's green earth? Would you ever say that about yourself? No, you wouldn't because you do not, no, that's not how it works. You never boast, right? You'd be humble and kind. And really it is so much better if somebody else says something kind about you, don't self promote, right? I think that's right. Okay, so, oh, um, I'm just gonna work this for a second. I'm not quite sure what, oh, I know. All right, now I can. Oh, I'm not quite sure. So today I need to concentrate on enough and finished. 
as opposed to perfect. And as opposed to perfection, actually, let's just say that. Oh, it's actually very pretty. It's, uh, I mean, this color, it's actually kind of buttery, actually. Sorry, if you were my English teacher, you would be admonishing me for being redundant and using the same word, actually. But what the hell, right? I mean, is it self actualization? Like, where, what we strive for? I don't know. Depends on what psychology is your persuasion, I guess. All right, so here we go. I always thought I was going to be a college professor, and I've only risen to the high heights of substitute teaching. Mm. So, I kind of wish I was live, and so you. I think what I have to do is just stay live and then I'm gonna have to edit the heck out of this, right? And so what I, here's my question when it comes to video editing and my YouTube channel is, you know, from a monologue standpoint, me speaking into the camera, so to speak, how does it, how do I actually, do I have to do an overlap? and restate a sentence with maybe a different outfit on or a different angle in order to transition, right? So from a creator standpoint, how does that work? You know, seems like that would be good. Um, and that that would allow for some um, easy transition, maybe, and simple editing, but only if I feel or deem it absolutely necessary to have a different, like, angle or interesting, like, interruption of my video. So there's this thing called... Interruption, <laughs> phenomena, Ooh, phenomena. I actually need like set, like the Muppets to play right now. When I'm when I'm thinking like this, I'm serious. Sometimes I just need the, you know, the old school like skits of like the methods, right? Phenomena. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's your loss. Um. So anyway. I'm trying to think if it's the if it is just simple like it's 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 not it's actually okay. I think the business term is not interruption; it is disruption. And so, if you have an appropriate measure of disruption, you will continue to keep the interest of your audience, right? What do you think, President Trump? What do you think, President? Who's living right now? Which former presidents are living? Obviously, Obama. So what do you think, President Obama? Uh, what do you think, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden? What do you think, President Bush? We say former president, but let's just be honest. If you're not a sitting president, you might have been a former president, but no matter what, you've been the president. So what do you think, President Bush? What do you think, President Bush? Isn't both the Bush guys still? I think they're still alive. What do you think? I'm sorry. I still think you are absolutely nauseating. And 
I think that, you know, the way that people feel about President Trump is exactly how I feel about you, Bill Clinton, and your wife, to nausea, and um, to nauseam, to absolute nauseam. Yeah. What a disgusting, disgraceful, and... And, um, I, you know, I don't care about Hillary or your mistress. Um, you know, I hold you responsible and I think your apology was weak. Sorry, Oprah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like those people that are still alive that were f sitting in the uh, presidential office, you know, you must have some thoughts. I mean, what the heck? I am a voting citizen. Why wouldn't you answer me, right? I mean, why not? I know you all follow me. <laughs> President Bush, how old are you, right? I mean, what is the old, who is the oldest? I mean, Jimmy Carter died. Ford's dead. Who's still living? Everybody since. Nixon? Is that right? You guys are old. Is that right? Ford. Ford. Carter. Everybody since Carter? Oh, come on, some of you. Come on. Come on, my attorney friends. Help me. Okay. So all of you gentlemen of the gentlemen's club, if you will, I use that word loosely because of the disproportionate number of conservatives and conservatives and liberals, but, you know, somebody... And I'm sure you've heard this too, but somebody would argue that Kennedy was yeah. Uh, if you teleported um, JFK into today's world, he would be a conservative. So, you know, actually, at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, you're all just men, <laughs> and you're surrounded by women that have actually helped you to rise to the occasion. Don't go dirty minded on me, any of you, men or women, but I'm just saying like rise to the occasion. And every one of you had a mother who was not crazy. That's the bottom line. And so, um, yeah, let's just say good moms. Good moms actually produce good men. That's what I'm going to say. There was a great post this morning. I think it was originated today. I should go check. And it was all, it was so, I didn't get all the way through it, but I reposted it. And it was all about moms. And it was like, it is the uh, toughest job. And uh, the gentleman who uh, was interviewing, which, why didn't they have a woman interviewing for it? I mean, in, why wasn't a woman interviewing the inter, like, why wasn't she hiring, right? Oh, by the way, because, yeah, she already holds that job, so. <sighs> And that could wreak havoc with all of your uh, feminist positions, but just or masochistic or any of those fancy words of like men versus women, disparity, whatever, whatever, whatever. Moms matter. I'm very concerned about the moms in the world. I'm particularly concerned about moms in the world. I think if you're not supporting a mom, and I mean, like, um, from a moral standpoint, like a moral support, if you don't have moral support for moms, then you should be sent to Antarctica. 
and left for dead. Yeah, that's what I think. So, yeah, it's a toughie. It's a tough job. And especially because, like, it's our job to raise them to be independent, decent, good. I mean, all the pressure is on us, and they hate us. I mean, I'm sorry, all of you that are in your 15 to 25-year-old decade, that sucks for moms. And I see this, and I see it, and I see it. But um, I know plenty of people that are in their decade of 20s, and they are not for their moms. Actually, I'm so wanting to do a survey, but there's nobody on this live stream except for me. But I want to say, like, raise your hand if... We can just pretend, I guess, but now raise your hand if... Raise your hand if you're in your 20s and you hate your mom. That's a problem. Now, raise your hand if you hate your mom. That's a problem. I'm just going to default to love trumps. You know, love is what actually people rise to and from, if you want to look at it from that perspective, right? I'm not saying that Abe Lincoln's mom, who, you know, he is absolutely an outlier. Um, Maxwell, I mean, Max Gladwell, I mean, what's your face, right? Maxwell Gladwell, what, what is your name? It's, is it Maxwell? It's not, please tell me I'm not getting like two names merged. Malcolm Gladwell, Max, uh, John Max, oh my, how embarrassing. Yeah, well, yeah, well, don't laugh. Um, yeah, I've read the books, but I don't always remember. Uh, I've actually read many of the books to my kids. Who moved my cheese? You know what? I actually got rid of Peter Sis's book. It's, it, it's phenomenal to me. Like uh, Peter Sis is in Czech Republic. Uh, children's author. What a horrible child's book that was. I was in such awe because really it was not a children's book uh, by the standards of, and and of course, like I'm getting ready to brace myself, all of you global people who are going to put down Americans for being so dumb or wanting, you know, cartoons and entertainment and freedom and debt, blah, 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 blah. but like Peter Sis. Both of your books were so cerebral. No wonder kids fall asleep. I think I fell asleep. I don't even know if I ever got to the end. Of course I did. Of course I did. Of course I did. But I gave those books away. But, you know, about the cat and about the... But of course I got to the end because I love to read. And I actually have a major regret because I didn't push my kids to read enough. I have a major, major, major regret. Although I actually am very proud of the fact that my son, my oldest son, read a whole book in one day. Um, and uh, But the art and joy of reading cerebral books in America might be a dying thing. And because of YouTube, and creators, cliff notes, so to speak. Can we just actually feminize this YouTube? Like, what if it was not called cliff notes? What if it was called Lady Thor's notes, right? Like, let's just uh, condense uh, and summarize and be able to speak and articulate so that the first, second, or third grader would be able to understand the concept and the point that you're making. I have so many people in my life, particularly grown men, that are like, what's the question? <laughs> when it comes to me, they have a freaking hard time listening to me. So, although there's country music songs about rambling men, people don't like rambling women. Nope. 
Ah, just go watch the Barbie movie is all I'm going to say. You talk about the futility of being a woman. She nails it. Ugh, it's very good and playful. I bet they don't have Barbies in Germany. Do they? Do they have Barbies in, in Russia? I mean, we might have Asian Barbies in America, but do they have Barbies all over the globe? I mean, do people really like American stuff? American trends? You know, that was pretty sick, actually. And I don't mean that in the, you know, modern youth way of totally radical sick. I mean, like, ew, a baby ill in the Barbie movie when, um, you know, that guy, whatever his face is from, you know, American Lampoon's, what is your name? You know, like when you, yeah, the epitome of not very smart um, depiction. Yeah, was the CEO. <sighs> wonder what it would have been like if Donald Trump was the CEO. And I say that because I feel like I was thinking of Hulk Hogan, sorry, Jesse Ventura, sorry, and yes, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ronald Reagan because like charisma acting, you know, I often say, you know, in America you have, on the West Coast you have Hollywood, but on the East Coast you have Washington, D.C. And then of course there's the other usual suspects, but that's all I'm saying, meaning big cities. Ah, you know who I'm thinking about right now is my cousins my lady cousins, but all of my lady cousins in Scotland and their moms. And um, I also am thankful because my cousin Sheila, which by the way, just so you know, Sheila is um, very much a, we're going to change angles here, folks. And so Sheila is very much a she idiom in Scotland, like in America, we say John Doe, Jane Doe, like Sheila is very much a typical she name like that in Scotland. And uh, her husband, Tom, why would I like to go back? God, could I supplant myself somewhere else? I've been looking for... I have been looking for employment, just so you know. Can I substitute teach in Scotland? <laughs> substitute teaching even a job? Let me just tell you, it is like my grandmother used the word job as in a big, big poo. And um, that's kind of gross, but... Yeah, substitute teaching can be like that sometimes. It's like a big, big, big poo. How disgusting. Ugh. All right, so I'm just asking for forgiveness right now because I am tired. I'm rambling. Being a bit silly, which my British friends say a bit silly. That's not a good thing from Brit standpoint. But what about from the Scottish standpoint? Aaron's from no, sorry, but I think the Irish, I, they love being silly. Uh, they take pride in it. Right. It's so funny because when I studied Irish American history, you know, people identify way more with the foolishness of the Irish. And, um, you know, and it's because of St. Patrick's Day, they say, but um, the rowdy and the spiritedness of the Irish. Uh, then the English and then of Wales and, of course, then of Scotland. 
Am I missing any? The UK territories. Oh, no. Anyway, um, terrible angle, right? Ugh. What are you doing today? And when I say that, I mean you, and I mean whatever day you're viewing this. So, uh, here's what I'm told. Well, not really told, but when I view YouTube, zzz, I'm told that sometimes you make a video and three years later it goes viral. I suppose it would need to be something incredibly compelling. Certainly not a think tank kind of question. Not philosophy. Ugh, gosh, right? That's so blech, rhetorical. Uh, what else? Politics, religion, and money. Those are three hot topics. Contentedly, I'd like to speak about and be well informed on all three. Is there something wrong with that? Please tell me. I feel like less food. Those are major components of cultures. Less music, of course. Of course, how can I forget about music? Oh, what are some other absolute uh, components of culture? I'm trying to think, I have, I have my son at the Jewish Community Center when he was, no, he's 27, but when he was a little boy, and I had every intention of exposing him to as many cultures as I could. So, I mean, but all these baby Einstein, uh, yeah. not just not just the tapes, and not just the you know VCRs or whatever. I mean, I, you know, we played these things. <laughs> exposure, exposure, exposure. And um, I've actually had people totally criticize, like, what's the word? Well, actually, maybe, yeah, totally criticize me and challenge me as I think exposure can sometimes result, sometimes result in learning slash osmosis. And so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of a leap, but... If you don't know what those words mean, look them up. I'm hoping some of these words that I use. One time my son said, would you please not use such big words? And I was like, absolutely not. I raised you. And if you can't keep up with me, I'm not dumbing my speech down for you, son. <sighs> okay. Um, but yeah. And then actually when I sub, actually, there's that word again. Um yeah, when I sub, I get comments about words that I choose, like euf, is that, wait, euf, wait, let me think of this. I took linguistics when I was in college. And, you know, the air quote slang of um, African-American slang slash poor, beg your pardon, but poor language a sloppy language or whatever, cultural slash, you know, again, speaking from a linguistic standpoint, was ubonics. Euphemism was coming to my mouth and that I knew that was not what I was searching for. But yeah, I mean, I think vocabulary is good, right? The more words you know, the more roots you know of because all words are made up of roots and so the more words you know the more roots you know and therefore the more opportunities for organic growth in your mind so from a linguistic standpoint I don't care if you are fluent in English 
And I would be happy to teach you English as a second language, but here's the caveat. You'd have to teach me your language. And as such, if you cannot, which I'm told by a romantic professor years ago that the only or the best way to learn another language is to fall in love with somebody from another country. <laughs> I think that's quite beautiful, actually. Very romantic. I'll tell you what isn't romantic. I actually sent, and I say I sent, but I, I only mean that. as metaphoric because it wasn't me, but I was the human resources person and we had a gal who I respected a lot and she's very bright. I remember her first name and I don't remember her second name, but anyway, we'll just call her Leslie. And so Leslie actually went to um, India and I was worried because we were we were actually training many, many, many people in India. And I was on the phone with people in China and India um, at that point in time. I had not been exposed to the IBMers in Costa Rica. And uh, I want to say that IBM had Polish people when I was at one of the corporations. Anyway, I love culture and so if I get an opportunity to work with an expat or an international person, uh, you can better believe that my grandfather and grandmother's Scottish and my other grandparents' uh, mutt-ish, <laughs> um, you know, but friendly attitude um, comes out. And so I ask about culture. Yeah, so anyway, back to this. Sorry, you folks, I really need to get a wet rag. And I have to keep pressing on. I really want to finish this. This is how people got stuff done. I believe it in the, um, in the pandemic is there's a certain level of accountability if you go live and you tell and you tell uh, people that, you know, you've started a project. Now, here's the other thing. You know, if inertia is a problem, we say inertia, but I'm going to actually cinemize, cinemize, use the synonym of inertia slash procrastination. But if inertia is a problem, you know, many people, once they get started, as long as they set their mind to it, we'll finish, right? So, you know, this phenomenon, phenomenon, right? The Muppets. Is that Sesame Street or the Muppets? Oh, either way, there's overlap, burrito. Um, so anyway. Once you get started, at some point you will end. And so quality matters, finishing strong matters, being strong matters, but sometimes it's not about any of those things. Sometimes it genuinely is about just getting started and taking it easy and allowing the flow to finish. Notice a couple things. I'm, I'm really not doing anything that is to a level of finishing quality. I literally did not prime this wood, which some of you that are perfectionists slash painters, you know, are gonna, you know, admonish and or you know, scold me for, if you will. Um, but, one thing I do know about painting, if there is paper on the wood, and I don't care if it's painting, I don't care if it's the, the actual trade of putting vinyl on cars, 
I really don't care if it's, I don't, I don't know, but like if there is a substance that is soluble, like soap, which is what I'm contending with right here, this white, you know, and I paint over it, <clears throat> there's going to be a barrier and the chances of peeling, you know, it just, it just increases. It's just common sense. So much of production, how things are done, how things are made, you know, Henry Ford, industrialization, and, you know, the boring, absolutely boring, uncreative, you know, assembly lines that have really come out, which are, you know what, just give it up. Let's just, you know, the hell with the unions in America. Sorry, all of you union members and union organizers that are getting paid lots of money, but really the hell with the unions. How about if we just have good HR, get rid of all the gosh darn unions in America. And then like people can, because there's this illusion that unions unionize people and somehow there's camaraderie and blah, blah, blah. But really they are a parasite. They do not help people. Their sole existence has to do with creating a layer of monetary layering, bureaucracy, right? So what if we did that? Like no more teacher unions. Well, I guess that would put people out of work. No, actually probably not because many, 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 many of the unions take advantage of the teachers. And so a few of them get a few extra dollars while the majority of them pay all this money and those people continue to be powerless. But um, since they get a few extra dollars, that is the biggest union. And yes, the UAW is a huge union in education. I think the education sector is the biggest unionized sector in America. But you know what? It's kind of stupid. And yes, it's very American, but it is kind of stupid. And the reason why I say that is it's really stupid. You know, like, how is it that Japan can come in, Toyota, Honda, even Hyundai, right? This, I don't know. Hyundai probably is unionized. I don't know enough about the, the Hyundai slash Kia brand. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, by and large, Honda plants, oil plants don't have to be unionized. And they are smart enough, unlike, and I don't get this big three, to, you know, they actually put together the Hondas and the, there's more Hondas and Toyotas put together in America than there are American cars. Because actually the big three send the parts to other countries like Mexico to put their cars together. All right. I actually took German in high school and I always think about Germany, especially think about, oh, unfortunately, I feel like the Germans think Americans are idiots, but I guess actually, you know, I think it's easy for you to criticize, but you know, then again, Hitler was your guy. And you talk about blind following. Actually, my neighbor was talking about Hitler and the Catholic Church and how the Catholic Church paved a trail to South America uh, for sanctuary for uh, Dr. Mendel. Mengel. 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 Right? Ugh. I'm thankful though. I'm thankful that it is it's Martin Luther King Day. 
if today's the only day that today will be. And so it is super, super, super cold in Ohio. That's where I live. Like, I mean, it's it's one degree Fahrenheit, or actually it might be zero. And when it comes to globalization, you know, this isn't a new conversation. Oh, right. I mean, I can remember talking about like the metric system. Yes, in America, we talked about why we did not use the metric system, system right? A lot that goes on. There is a lot of learning, but you know what? Here's the thing, and this is not for the critics. This is for the students. You have to be interested and curious and want to learn, and henceforth, you have a certain degree of responsibility. And so, yeah, you can, on dad's mom's dime, go to college. But unless you actually get curious, challenge, bring enough contrary-ism, sorry, I don't like the isms, but because to me isms just reeks and stenches of dysfunction, but you know, contrary theory, right? Contr like asking good questions, challenging the, status, the last, challenging the status quo, whatever. You know, if you learn to learn and somehow get bit by the curiosity bug and continue, innovation is going to happen. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to. And um, yes, China, you know, somehow leapfrogged or is jumping, you know, has, you know, made great strides. But um, I think Japan probably still has you beat when it comes to uh, I mean, I think reverse engineering has taken hold, but I just, I don't know. I actually favor the Japanese when it comes to electronics. Sorry, Korean people too. But uh, yeah, I remember when my kids were in school and they would, and it wasn't, it's, they're still in their 20s, so it's not been that long ago, but like, yeah, I mean, my kids focused on Asian culture and Asian thought. Now, I read this book and I read it. I'm not impressed really, but Joy Luck Club. Not sure if the author is American or Asian. Oh, shoot. Anyway, but yeah, typically I do. Oh my gosh, you guys. All right, I'm going to have to stop. I have, a, oh, I have a problem. I'm not going to panic, but I'm getting. I don't know here to be did, so let me just balance myself here. You know, actually painting is not a high intensity or nor cerebral activity. No need to get frustrated. Well, anyways, my best friend growing up's mom was born in Okinawa. And so I remember she often would, oh, I love this woman. But anyway, she and her son would often like, she doesn't speak English, you know, don't worry about her. <laughs> and I, listen, um, I, I say best friend, but I would never have, I love you. I love you, Dina, but I never would have, that was too uncool. I would never have air quotes, had a best friend. Ah, right. Like that wasn't just, I just didn't define my friendships like that. But, you know, in looking back, I would say you probably were my best childhood friend. Definitely. Anyways, um, when we were in the eighth grade, we went to the Embassy Suites. Her father was, um, he drove a Mercedes and um, mom was Japanese and her father actually worked for the American government. And so to me, that sounded so good, like actually top secret, like holy crow, you know. But And George was very smart. But his mom... Not, not George's mom, but um, but Dina, sorry, her mom, but Dina's mom. She was so smart and interesting. To me, she was so interesting. 
I loved her. And she always offered me rice, even if it was just, you want some rice? And um, many times I'd say yes. And she would just serve me some rice and it was not a big deal. And, and Dina was patient with me. <clears throat> another mom that I, oh, another good friend of mine, a good, good friend of mine. Her mom was an attorney. Oh my gosh, Mrs. Leslie. And um, gosh, Shannon's older sister was such a, like to me, kind of a Barbie doll. And I'm, 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 I'm very, very sorry if that's insulting. But I had another friend actually when I moved to Ohio and Sarah was so, so intelligent. And to me, her daughter, her daughter, her sister was kind of like that. Like I say kind of like a book. I mean, like, you know, just I'm just going to actually I don't know how to redefine it, but like snooty patootie ish or just, you know, I don't know, like. Maybe more typical, like, I guess all three of us, whether it was. Me and Dina, me and Shannon, me and Sarah. Like to me, all of those three were atypical. I don't know if I'm atypical, but uh, to me, they were all atypical. Very smart, very strong, very thoughtful, very observant. And oh my gosh, Mrs. Lesky, I just, you know. I was, and you were an attorney. You might have been the first attorney that I ever knew. So George, Jake goes, Jake, J George. I don't even know what he did in the government. That sounded so official. And then of course his wife stayed at home, but she did dote. Oh my gosh, did she keep a close eye on them? Drove Dina crazy, but you know what? We had a lot of freedom and not a lot of supervision at my house up on the farm, but I loved it. I loved the supervision and I loved interacting with her. You know what, actually, to another uh, Kevin Hertzfeld, a friend of mine. Oh my gosh. Um, his, oh, what a nice family. Kevin and yeah, his mom. Well, actually, his dad. Actually, I'm mean, just, let me just, oh, no, I'm going to say his parents, but, um, like, what a nice family. And then, yeah, I mean, no kidding, Kristen Heising. Gosh, I've had a lot of classy moms. Um, I have had a lot of classy moms. And, you know, good classy dads uh, to look up to or emulate if I had to choose a word. Which emulate just means, you know, pretend to be like for all my junior high and or elementary kids that happen to be, you know, listening in. Because your mom's probably watching this, right? Because why in the world would anybody tune into this channel, especially if somebody's going on and on about moms and mothering? The mothership. Mother Nature. Mother Earth. Can I just stop though? Can I just tell you that in America we have these classic, what I call classic, um, like Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, Claymation. And I really liked Jack Frost, Mother Nature. I love those. It's super fun to go back and watch like Rudolph the you know, red nose reindeer and some of those old claymations. Oh, okay. If I was like a high level videographer, I would actually slip in a link. But my gosh, how long is this? You've got to be bored. What time is it? I think I could splice this into maybe three episodes. Oh my gosh, what if it's not even on? Welcome the live chat. Welcome to live chat. Remember to something your privacy. Uh, well, I don't have anybody in here because I don't have any subscribers that have joined my live stream. 
I think I only have a few subscribers, but I don't care. That doesn't matter. I have no idea. Maybe someday all this rhetoric will make some sense to somebody. But here's the thing. You gotta stay curious and you gotta take responsibility for yourself. And so I'm gonna say love Trump's do the next right thing, stay curious, and have a good day. So thanks for joining. And I'm over and you're out. Right? Right. How do I turn you off? End stream. Bye.